All right, everybody, the core set has been revealed. We've got a bunch of new cards and some rebalanced cards, and we know which cards are going to be in standard format this year. So I'm going to review the new cards, and I'm going to review any rebalanced cards if they got uh, buffed, etc. And uh, I'm going to split that out across a couple of videos. I don't know how exactly I'm going to do it, but this video is probably going to have like six to eight cards just to get something out quick. And then I'm going to come back and do a bigger video uh, with all the other stuff. So I'll focus on some of the cooler, newest things here, like Alex Straza, the Life Binder, right here behind me. A uh, new version of Alex Straza, 9 mana, 8 8 dragon. That's the same. Battle Cry changes. Choose a character. If it's friendly, restore 8 health. And if it's an enemy, deal 8 damage. So this similar duality here for Alex Straza, where. Uh, it can go face and deal some damage. It can heal you uh, a little bit of health back as well. But on top of that now, it can also hit minions. This is an enemy uh, and a character, not just heroes in this instance. So uh, that's going to make Alex Raza considerably more flexible from a tempo standpoint, like able to trade into a minion on board so that um, you know it's not just this like combo setup or you know desperation style heal. It could maybe still be that a little bit where you chip your opponent's health total down Probably not as significantly as with old Alex Straza, where often you could do like a full 15. This will only do eight, and it may not heal you a full 15. It'll only heal eight, but it has that extra flexibility when you need it, which I think is actually pretty important. Sometimes it's really hard to play Alex Straza because you can't just leave some giant minion on your opponent's side of the board. But with this version of Alex Straza, it's a little bit easier to squeeze it into turns. That said, the question is here is like, is it still enough output? Like for a nine mana card, is this making a big enough sort of play and that's a little bit bigger question, I think, because um, there are smaller cards that do similar sorts of things that aren't you know, committing a full nine mana. And nine mana in particular is a really hard mana cost to play in Hearthstone because you can basically rarely ever do anything else with it. So, you know, of course, Dragon decks and Highlander style decks and all those sorts of things could love a card like this to fill in those late game slots. But I don't think it's quite as powerful as the previous Electraza as a like control or combo enabler. And I don't think it's quite as good as Dragon Queen Alex Straza, something like fits into Highlander. Obviously, that was specialized for that goal. So I'm thinking maybe this is left somewhere in a gap that's like solid. It makes sense. It's more flexible, but maybe it's not specific enough or doesn't fill a niche enough like the previous versions of Alex Straza so that it might often just get kind of left behind. All right, moving on to Nas Dormu, the Eternal here. Actually changing cost, going down to seven mana, still an 8-8. Eight, eight. Start of game, though, if this is in both, players decks turns are only 15 seconds long so you can basically agree to speed hearthstone if you want to run nasdormu with your deck and so does your opponent uh if you don't want to <laughs> play speed hearthstone don't run nasdormu which means i think really this is just a meme card there's not much reason to run a seven mana eight eight there's nothing that particularly exciting about it and uh, since it's a starting game effect, you know, when it pops into games, it's not going to ruin them like Nazdormu has done sometimes in the past with some real accessibility issues. So nobody's really going to play this unless you're just trying to meme on ladder, which, of course, we'll do. <laughs> but from a competitive standpoint, trying to make the best deck, there's really no reason to include a 7-mana 8-8. But those few times when it aligns and your opponent runs Nazdormu, that's going to be a lot of fun. So a cool card that it exists, but definitely not one that you should expect really any competitive viability for as far as I'm concerned. So next up here is Onyxia the Brood Mother, getting a new version of Onyxia, which is cool. I didn't expect that. She's a nine mana eight eight, still a dragon, of course. And at the end of each turn, fill your board with one one whelps. So instead of on this battle cry aspect, where you just get this one round of whelps, now with this Onyxia, you can occasionally get multiple boards of whelps. It's kind of like a new Shuma. But, but an 8-8 eight, eight, instead of a 1-7 and a little bit more expensive, which, you know, there's some neat uh, potential utility there if you're just looking for another big reload late in the game and something like a token-style deck. It can be nice to stagger a board with a big 8-8 eight, eight and a bunch of 1-1s. One, Shumont didn't really present much of a threat on board, but Onyxia will. So if your opponent focuses on removing a bunch of small stuff, they can leave behind an 8-8 eight, eight, or maybe vice versa. It might be hard for them to clear everything super efficiently and if onyxia sticks around of course that's going to create some problems for them so your one ones might become the sort of leftover value that you're able to realize here and uh, i mean this is just better than old onyxia now of course old onyxia is not a card we've seen played like at all lately it's like very rarely popped into some decks way back in the day but uh, it's not a great card and i don't really think this one's that much better that it will be a good card again either i think this will still be 
Uh, difficult to use at nine mana. Still come down too late in the game to really make an impact. Token decks are usually looking to hit their stride much, much earlier in a game. There have been a few, like, you know, sort of infinite reload token decks or just trying to be that with things like, you know, uh, Forest, Age, Druid, where they just board after board after board. And maybe you could squeeze this in, but I think you'd still prefer cheaper, more flexible board builders than something like Onyxia. But, you know, there's always those sweet spots where a dragon deck and a token deck or some other craziness aligns where a card like this has that, that chance to be played. It's just not a very likely one. So next up here is Talon Forgering, a new neutral minion, five mana, three, three, with a taunt and divine shield. So actually kind of an annoying mid game minion for sure. It's gonna be a bit of a road a speed bump for people, roadblock for people as they try to push through it. But also a neat little death rattle here, draw your highest cost minion. So a very cool tutor style effect that you could see being uh, rather impactful. All kinds of things like combo decks or just having really key big cards in a control deck where you're trying to find that exact rattle gore, trying to find that hero card, whatever it is, that's your highest cost card. Talon enables you to do that you know, twice as reliably, essentially. Either you draw it or you draw this legendary and you get a chance to hit it one more time. On a body, I think that's disruptive enough that uh, it's probably worth it in many decks where this is going to slow down your opponent a little bit just because, you know, Divine Shield, Taunts, just sticky, annoying. And then you get this upside of the Death Rattle that your deck's built around or you're going to really be able to utilize well. So I don't think this is going to be like a Zilliax style five drop where it's just everywhere. It's certainly not uh, as disruptive without Rush or Lifesteal. But it's a cool, like, you know, kind of next door sort of card where it's a little bit more value driven or tutor driven, but still has some of that same aspect of Zilliax with the Taunt and Divine Shield. So uh, there were instances where you just plop Zilliax on five and it felt okay. I think there'll be instances for sure where you plop this on five, you're just happy to keep moving through your deck and developing a decent minion along the way. So um, yeah, I think this looks like a really solid card that a handful of decks will be able to utilize really well to find those very specific cards that they're looking for. There might be others that don't even care and they're just okay with a reasonable five drop that draws a card. That might just be enough sometimes here for Talon. So in both cases, um, a card that I'm sure we'll see some kind of play. So next up here is Corvass Bloodthorn for Demon Hunter, a two mana two two with charge and life steal. And it reads, after you play a card with Outcast, return this to your hand. So a really interesting little card. Charge again, coming back to Demon Hunter, which is absurd. You've also got some life steal here. So a card uh, that'll give you a lot of like stretch potential, basically chipping in damage while staying alive. That's something that's great to go longer in a game if you need to find those little extra bits of damage. This is kind of like a pin flinger adjacent card, right? Where you're playing it, you're getting some damage and you're bouncing it back to hand. It's a little bit more difficult than pin flinger, right? Cause outcast cards aren't gonna be as cheap or easy as any random spell, like zero mana spells for Paladin, for instance, and Libra Paladin's great with pin flingers. This will be a little harder, but still similar sort of effect. It's just probably usually gonna go face, but it's also gonna heal you a little bit along the way too. So you could imagine grinding this out over four or five turns, you know, hitting face, maybe six, seven, eight times with it, it's gonna add up a lot. And it's gonna be possible if you build your deck to support it that way. So I think that's really cool game plan for this, or maybe not cool, but a powerful game plan for this actually sounds kind of terrifying and horrible, <laughs> but at least um, a high utility one. I think it's, it's viable, let's say. Uh, and then alternatively, I think there'll be sometimes you're happy to play this on turn two and you don't even care if you bounce it back. Um, you know, you could just play this and take a trade and, um, save some life and clear a minion, or maybe just go face with it and you're fine to get some chip damage or, you know, slot it into a turn five, clear your opponent's three, two, and it healed you a little along the way. And it was great. So, you know, one instance of this card, like taking a trade, not necessarily a bad minion, right? That's kind of okay for two mana, but then that upside, when you do get to bounce this multiple times and get multiple use cases out of it, that becomes a particularly powerful utility for this one, I think that um, certain decks would be able to utilize well. Now, some decks that that might be too slow or they may not have enough outcast cards. I don't know if this is good enough to totally build around since it is just a one of unlike Pinflinger decks, which can maybe more reliably hit those. But you could still imagine a slightly grindier Demon Hunter, even something like Soul Fragment Demon Hunter that's looking to uh, extend a game a little bit longer could probably use a card like Corvass in that slot uh, just to keep that extra damage flowing and filling your mana cost basically so you're floating less mana I think that becomes a really flexible, nice tool 
to have. Just toss it in, get something extra out of your turn here and there, and that goes a long way for a single card. So Corvus Bloodthorn looks really strong to me. So next up here, this is a crazy card. It's Aegwyn, a uh, famous, famous Warcraft character. Uh, she's a 5-mana five 5-5 five with spell damage plus 2 and death rattle. The next minion you draw inherits these powers. Now, I, I don't know exactly what that means, but I think that means they get spell damage plus 2 and death rattle. The next minion you draw inherits these powers. It is powers, so it sounds like it's multiple things. So I think basically this is an infinite chain of adding spell damage plus two to every next minion that you draw. And that sounds kind of crazy to have in this like super reliable spell damage tool that just keeps getting added into uh, your game plan. And if you have enough minions, if they're cheap enough, flexible enough, I think you could do some pretty crazy stuff with this. And I don't even think Aegwyn's going to be that hard to play either. It's like you know, she's not great as a five mana five five, but there are plenty of ways you can use that spell damage plus two with a couple cheap flexible cards, squeeze this into a six, seven, eight mana turn, and it's going to feel fine. And then you're going to create this chain that's going to pay off for the rest of the game. So I think spell damage mages could use this really well as a way to just keep churning out spell damage advantages. I think, you know, any kind of Highlander list, if those are still going to be a thing or not uh, in the future, even would love a card like this one. Control mages could probably extract a lot of value out of this over time, just using, you know, extra little buffs here and there to spell damage. You might even be able to create some crazy combos um, where, you know, Sorcerer's Apprentice style cards. I don't know if Sorcerer's Apprentice is still in core. I haven't looked, but cards like that where you're discounting mana or doing other cheesy sorts of things. Uh, if they get spell damage added onto them, the cheese factor can be multiplied and who knows what that could enable for some sort of extra combo. So, a few different angles of play as far as I'm concerned here for this card. It looks really, really cool, and it's a fun design. I'm, I'm excited to give this one a shot for sure. So I think we're going to call it there on uh, the cards here for this review. There's still a ton more cards, including new ones and rebalanced cards that I'm going to do in future reviews. I don't want these to go too long, and I wanted to get one out pretty soon to announce this news. I'm going to put a link in the description below uh, so you can go check out all the core set cards yourself. So take a look. Uh, you'll see these and many, many more. Uh, I also got to do some quick reviews, I guess, on these uh, real quick here. So we'll do that as well. Corvus is a four-star card. Talon Forgering is a four-star card. Nazdormu the Eternal is a one-star card. Alex Straws of the Lifebinder is a three-star card. Onyxia the Broodmother is a two-star card. Aegwyn the Guardian is a four-star card. And yeah, that's it, guys, for now. But again, stay tuned. More reviews coming. We got to talk about Lord Jaraxxus, some other rebalanced legendaries, uh, things like Scenarius getting a tiny buff. We got a lot of those other new cards as well to talk about. So more to come. Uh, stay tuned. This is just a brief preview. I just wanted to get a video done and out the door. So uh, come back very, very soon and stay tuned to YouTube. And uh, thanks for watching. And until next time, game on.